I mean, I have to say that I learned from my pain to be powerful. You know, when you're poor, everyone discriminates against you. But for me, I grew up in a, in a country where we experienced revolution, we experienced war, we experienced discrimination, we experienced um, being threat from the age of seven, if you don't wear hijab, you will get kicked out from a school. So I often get this question, how you find this? How you learn you to learn be brave? From your, you learn from your pain, you're I saying? said that I learned from my, actually I learned from my mother as well. My mom, uh, she's a tiny woman. She's not even able to read and write. I remember that in my village, um, we didn't have running uh, water, we didn't have electricity. I had to, we didn't even have, like, we didn't have inside bathroom. We had to use the outhouse, which was in mm -hmm. the backyard garden. So backyard garden was dark, blacker than black. It was a scary as a young girl, 10 year old girl. And I remember my mom used to tell me that if you wait for someone else to save you, you're not gonna win anything. Be your own savior, do your own work. So my mom taught me a lesson. She said that darkness is like a monster. If you're scared of the darkness, the darkness will swallow you all, will devour you. But instead, if you open your eyes as wide as you can, the darkness will disappear. As a kid, I thought this was a fact, and I, would, I used to go to the outhouse, <laughs> opening my eyes as wide as I could. And I found that, that it worked, it worked. So I scared so many times, even here in the West, I get scared of everything, but I open my eyes. <laughs> and this is how I learned from my mom, who's not a feminist, who's not a, as I told you, she's not even able to read and write. Where, where I experience darkness, then I have to go and I have to fight with it. Instead of being a victim, I have to be a warrior. This is how I learned from my pain to be powerful. But then, then there's, there's many other things to ask, of course. But there's, there's the thing you mentioned. Um, because other people are taking the risk. They're sending these videos to oh, you. Uh, and you're taking the risk, as has been shown by the fact that the Iranian government wants to kill you or abdic abdicate you. So I, I won't, I mean, let's not forget. Um, it's you as well. But you're right in, in a way, of course, you're... Um, you t it's a huge responsibility to, I mean, those people who are suppressed, I mean, it's very touching and very, very dramatic and sad. They take the risk to send videos to you. It's outlawed, 10 years of prison, in, in, in prison circumstances, which are not, you know, <laughs> the, so, and you decide to put it on, that puts a lot of burden on you. That's a very good question. And that's such a good way to ask this question. I'm gonna be very honest with you, <laughs> very honest with you. Often I get this question with Western journalists that don't you feel guilty that you put a lot of people in danger? You know that this is a crime and now you're asking them to send you videos? Thank you so much that you didn't put the blame on us because this is very heartbreaking to see that you're witnessing a regime in 21st century bittering up people, lashing people, executing people for the crime of thinking, for the crime of wanting to choose what they want to wear. And then you leave the regime, you go to Iran, you obey compulsory hijab laws as a Western female journalist, and then you come to me and ask me that, don't you feel guilty? That you ask me, no. Those who lashes us should feel guilty. Those who execute us should feel guilty. Those who actually ban me from hugging my mother should feel guilty. Those who put my brother in prison should feel guilty. Those who actually put the mother and daughter both together in prison right now that I'm talking to you should feel guilty. And those female politicians from Netherlands who goes to my beautiful country and say nothing about these discriminatory laws and they obey it and they bow the regime should feel guilty. My people in Iran, there are, how many Iranians are here? I know Maryam Namazi, before me she was an activist. How many Iranians are here now? So you know that. Iranian people 
They are so brave enough to break the law every day. So when they risk their lives, they have a message. So simple, because they want to be heard. And we are not the only one in the history doing that. Women of suffragists, Rosa Parks. So imagine the journalists and Western politicians telling me that, don't you feel guilty? So imagine how they would analyze the fight from women of suffragists. We have so many women of suffragists in Iran. We have so many Rosa Parks of Iran. I want to just end this question with an example. When Iran protests happened, which is the second anniversary of Iran protests right now, the government shut down the internet for three days and they killed 1,500 people. 1,500 people in three days. And that time, I asked Mark Zuckerberg, I asked Jake, Jack Dorsey, my pronunciation is correct, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that the government in Iran shut down the internet and they're killing people. And they have accounts on Twitter and Instagram. Kick them out. Why, they sh why should they be? And I ask female politicians, I ask global feminist movement, I ask so many human rights organizations, please help me. I have to get your support because we have to kick the supreme leader of Iran and dictators out from social media. Guess what was their answer? We are supporting freedom of speech. We are not going to do that. I said that Taliban, ISIS, Islamic Republic, you supporting their freedom to spread violence through social media. At the same time, Federico Mogherini was in Iran and taking selfie with the Iranian, <laughs> Iranian officials. Federico Mogherini is the, uh, high is the high representative of the European Union. Uh, uh, yeah, the high yes, yeah, true. On foreign policy. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, yeah. I lost my allies outside the world, and I didn't know what to do. And I asked those, when, when internet was like, after I think one month, the mothers found out they can reach, they can go to internet and spread their word. We, the Iranian people outside Iran, were all of us bombarded by videos, photos from mothers who were saying that when internet was shut down, my son got killed. One mother, Puya Bakhtiari, was a symbol of Iran protest. She came to me and she said that the same day when my son was killed, I was in the street with my son. We were both holding hands. We were protesting together. And the same day, my son in front of my house got killed. And I want you to spread my voice. I published her video. Again, I got this question from so many media, like politicians and Western media and human rights organization. Aren't you going to put her life in danger? So, and I'd ask her, and she told me that, just say this one. Ask a simple question to anyone in the West. Would you go and live in Iran under the law which do not give you to have a real election to vote for who you want to vote? Would you go and live under Sharia laws which actually uh, kick you out from a school from the age of seven? If they say yes, tell them all come to Iran and live here. If they say no, tell them shut up. <laughs> and don't, yes, that's it. Honestly, I mean normally I'm, I, I, I use, uh, I'm politically correct, but that was the message <laughs> from a mother that if anyone said that, don't you feel guilty, tell them, Okay, so you go to Iran and live under Sharia laws. And now the situation in Afghanistan as well. And I want to actually tell what I said uh, in the opening, that I got bombarded the, from the women of Afghanistan as well the day when Taliban took over. And the women were brave, beautiful, amazing, sending videos to me. I was scared for them. And I told one of them that I'm going to blur your face, then I'm going to publish the video. And the woman said something, this is going to be the last sentence of this event, maybe. She said that, you want to blare my face? This is what Taliban does to me. Don't. I'm actually using your platform to take my visibility back. So help me to be my true self. I did, and two days later, she was in front of the rally, and her picture was on Guardian. It was on CNN and was everywhere. So when you're allowing people to express themselves, they feel that they have agency and they can be powerful to get other women on their side. So these women have their agency and help them to be heard. That's all they want. 
I know I'm loud and I'm talkative. You can stop me anytime you want. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I will if I think it's necessary. I don't, I'm not going to stop you if it's, if it's, if it's not helping our conversation. Thank you. The whole idea of what it is to stand out and to, to, to speak out and to be a dissenter. And I think you said many wonderful things, but one of them is very, I think, important for us. Um, you not only protest against the, the regime in Iran, you have to battle the whole um, a Western press in many ways as well, because, 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 and that's of course the same idea of dissenting, this, this wrong, putting the blame on you instead of the bl where the blame belongs. Again, this is sort of um, um, uh, uh, very recommendable that you are able to point out, you know, where you dissent and how important it is. And um, uh, we always think that we live in a free part of the world, though there is a thing like groupthink. There's a thing like um, uh, there's a thing like blaming the victim, like they are blaming you. So I think that's a very important lesson for us, um, uh, of, uh, who are not living in Iran but living here. And uh, uh, pointing that out is again this sort of dissenting. Exactly. way of looking at things. It's very beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's telling a woman who got raped that it's your fault. Yeah. And we used to hear that in Iran. That, I mean, even the green, uh, when uh, Me Too movement happened, I remember the supreme leader of Iran was saying that, oh, this is, he made a video, he shared it on Twitter, which is banned for Iranian people, and he said that uh, it's, the, it's uh, the Western women's fault because they don't know Islam and they don't wear compulsory job, so that's why they get raped every day. So they put the blame on, and I was said, wait a minute, in Iran, women get raped, but if they go to the court, it's their fault, because first they have to prove that they were fully covered. That's why I created a hashtag called, my camera is my weapon. It means that if we cannot make an official complaint, uh, just embarrass your harassers in public. Use your camera and film them. That's the way we that's the way our Me Too movement works in Iran. <laughs> our Me Too movement, yeah. Um, uh, that's a wonderful way of putting it. I'm, I'm wondering whether um, uh, uh, we, we have um, another guest. We will continue a uh, uh, conversation in a moment with Mohamedou Old Slai. Um, but before that, there might be people who want to join in, want to ask a question. Uh, maybe the, I gave the mayor a microphone. Maybe she has something to say. Or I to, think the mayor changed add. her mind. She's not going to invite me anymore. <laughs> I'm so too critical of the Western. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just listening. It's your, it's your moment to shine. So, and and it's really, it's, it's so courageous, and you're so wonderful, and so humanistic. So, well, um, I'm proud that you're here. Really proud. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions? Um, ah, Gatol has a. You have a microphone, Gatol? Or, oh. <clears throat> the woman in the red, in the red um, attire. Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to know, um, as a journalist, uh, you are living in America now. And um, you are almost like a bridge between uh, the West and the East. And, but sometimes uh, there is um, fake news from the Iranian government or from the Arabic countries about a woman situation. And sometimes it's the opposite from um, Western media. They all, always somehow publish all these uh, mainstream ideas about women. And do you find sometimes uh, fake news? And how do you deal with it? Do you, call, do you call the magazine to fix it? Does it make you angry? For example, Al Jazeera published an article about Muslim women feel uh, that uh, coronavirus gives them dignity because everybody has to wear mask, like everybody wear a niqab. And that's in Arabic, actually. They didn't translate it into uh, Al Jazeera English. So I was furious when I, when I read this. I feel your pain. Yes, yeah, so, so what is your solution when you, when, you, when you see some kind of this news? That's a very, very good question. Where are you from? I'm from Syria. That's why you ask this question, because we all um, share this pain from Syria, from my brother, <coughs> from Turkey. Um, we lost the narrative in the West. 
and we have to be clear and loud about it. Um, how we lost the narrative. For many, many times when I was actually challenging a compulsory job loss, I keep hearing from the media in the West, New York Times wrote an article and said that uh, compulsory job is a cultural issue and Western feminists and Western athletes should not touch the issue because it's a cultural issue. And when I was fighting and saying that like women and men are separated and they have uh, like, we have like only female park in Iran. We do. Can you, we do have just like women should be separated in one park and we have this kind of park in Iran. And then well-known journalist works for reliable media tweeting and saying that no, we never had this. When women get beaten up in the street, we saw that in one of the reliable media in the West saying that from now on, police is not going to arrest women. They're going to send them to educational uh, course. Mm -hmm. And another thing, for 42 years, women are fighting to enter a stadium. And two years ago, one of the women actually dressed like a boy. She entered the stadium, she got arrested, and she was sentenced to go to prison for six years. So she didn't, she couldn't handle it. So she set herself on fire and she killed herself. And because of the pressure, we, all we women launched a campaign. All of us, we got together from Iran to let the FIFA know that if you really care about equality, this is the time. Boycott Iran until the day when they allow Iranian women to enter a stadium. Guess what? The headline of all the Western media was, finally, women are allowed to go to a stadium. Why? Because the government know the scandal, know the pressure, so they allow a few women to go there, they make a pictures, and they send it to the media, and the media publish it. And Christian Amanpour, who was my role model, was actually telling Javad Zarif that, that's progress. And her face made me like furious. Why you say this is progress? Because this is a big lie. Yes, sister, I get furious, but my tactic, just being furious is not gonna work. <laughs> you, have to, you have to ask every single, this is my idea. They can go after activists in Iran and arrest them. They can shut down the newspaper in Iran. They can have their own lobbyists outside Iran. They can have their um, own mouthpiece in the media inside Iran. But if you make every single person to be a movement, to be a storyteller, to be their own media, Nobody can go after every single person. Social media is our weapon. So ask every single woman, go in front of the stadium, make a video. If they say that mask is for the dignity of women, ask every single woman in Syria to speak up. The day when Javad Zarif and Rouhani was on CNN, there was an ordinary woman standing next to uh, her, her husband. Her husband wore hijab. The woman were, was on way. And they were saying that we oppose compulsory hijab that the men were said, yes, I don't own my wife. Why should I wear hijab? That video got 11 million views, more than the supreme leader of Iran. That's how we can win the battle. I myself have 7 million followers. I'm not a model. I'm not an actor. This platform is the voice of ordinary people. And that shows the power of us. And we can win the battle if we all, every individual person, feel the responsibility to speak up. We're going to win the dictators and their fake news in the West. This is my way. Thank you.